I'm Chris Wallace. The president and his administration send mixed signals on the election threat from Russia. Russia attempted to interfere with the last election and continues to engage in malign influence operations to this day. Our democracy itself is in the crosshairs. But while top national security officials condemn Russian meddling, the president defends his meeting with Vladimir Putin. I had a great meeting with Putin. We discussed everything. Now we're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax. We'll discuss the apparent disconnect with the president's national security advisor, John Bolt, and with Marco Rubio, a top member of the Senate Intelligence and Foreign Relations Committee. Bolton and Rubio, only on Fox News Sunday. Then a federal judge blocks a Texas activist from putting blueprints online to make plastic guns on 3D printers. Cody Wilson joins us to explain why he thinks it's a good idea. Plus, just hours after this... No, I do not feel that the media is the enemy of the people. President Trump bashes journalists again. Whatever happened to fair press, whatever happened to honest reporting? They don't report it. They only make up stories. We'll ask our Sunday panel about the Trump family divide. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. While top national security officials say the threat from Russian meddling in the upcoming midterms is real, President Trump keeps calling it a hoax. It's just one of several issues along with North Korea and Iran, where the president's statements appear at odds with the rest of his administration. In a moment, I'll talk about the seeming disconnect with the president's national security advisor, John Bolton. But first, let's bring in Kristen Fisher in Columbus, Ohio, where President Trump held another of his highly charged rallies last night. Kristen. Well, Chris, this was President Trump's second campaign rally since five of his top national security officials stood side by side, sounding the alarm that Russia is continuing to try to interfere in our elections. And yet at both rallies, President Trump did not back them up. We got to stop meddling. We got to stop everybody from attacking us. But there are a lot. Russia's there. China's there. President Trump once again refusing to place the blame squarely on Russia. But he had no problem taking China to task for smacking U.S. farmers with retaliatory tariffs. China is targeting the American farmer because China is smart and they know the American farmers love Donald Trump. And they say, what can we do? to stop Donald Trump. The retaliatory tariffs are hitting one of the president's key constituencies, prompting a $12 billion bailout for farmers. The president's lengthy defense of his tariffs inside a sweltering high school gymnasium made clear he's feeling the heat. So much for my brand new beautiful suit. The president and Republicans are also feeling the heat, heading into Tuesday's special election for Ohio's 12th congressional district. It's why President Trump came to this reliably Republican district to rally his supporters around Troy Balderson, who's locked in a tight race with Democrat Danny O'Connor. A vote for Danny Boy and the Democrats is a vote to let criminals and drugs pour into our country and to let MS-13 run wild in our communities. And that is exactly what we can expect more of heading into the midterms. This was President Trump's third campaign rally this week, and that pace is only expected to accelerate. Chris? Kristen Fisher reporting from Columbus, Ohio. Kristen, thanks for that. Joining me now, the president's national security advisor, John Bolton, and ambassador. Welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Glad to be with you. Let's begin with breaking news. Uh, what leftist Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is calling an assassination attempt against him yesterday. Let's put up this video. Pretty striking. The president, President Maduro, speaking at a military event when drones loaded with explosives exploded. You can see security protecting him with ballistic blankets and military. It was a National Guard event at the event in Caracas began to stampede. Question, did the U.S. play any role and what's your reaction to what Maduro is calling an assassination attempt? 
Well, I can say unequivocally there was no U.S. government involvement in, in this at all. Uh, just uh, within the past couple of hours, I've spoken with our charge in Caracas, the head diplomatic official down there. He and his staff were up much of the night making sure that Americans uh, in Venezuela were safe as of now. We think everybody uh, noticed to the embassy uh, is in a secure position. They're going to evaluate conditions today. But uh, they focused on that principal responsibility and as of now feel pretty confident that Americans are accounted for. Now, with respect to what happened uh, uh, last uh, afternoon, uh, look, uh, it could be a lot of things uh, from a, a pretext set up by the Maduro regime itself to something else. He's made accusations accusing the outgoing president of Colombia of responsibility, what he calls the extreme right wing in Venezuela. That means the vast opposition to his authoritarian rule. And he's blamed uh, unnamed financiers in the United States. These are things he's said before. Uh, and uh, you have to take them for what they're worth. If the government of uh, Venezuela has hard information uh, that they want to present to us that would show a potential violation of U.S. criminal law, we'll take a serious look at it. But in the meantime, I think what we really should focus on is the corruption and the oppression of the Maduro regime in Venezuela. Let's turn to the apparent, and I suspect you'll challenge this, the apparent disconnect between what Trump administration officials are saying about Russian meddling in 2016 and in 2018 and what President Trump is saying about it. Here's how DHS Secretary Nielsen described the threat this week and then the president just hours later. Our democracy itself is in the crosshairs. I had a great meeting with Putin. We discussed everything. I had a great meeting. Now we're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax, okay? So, Ambassador, which is it? Is Russian meddling a threat to our democracy or is it a hoax? Look, I, I know that uh, there's this narrative in the press that there's a disjunction between the president and the rest of his administration. Uh, you know, I, I got to know Eugene McCarthy, the late Democratic senator, very well. He was a client of mine in Buckley against Vallejo. He's an iconoclastic guy. He used to describe the press as a group of birds sitting on a telephone wire. One would fly off and then they'd all fly off. And that, that's what this uh, narrative, I think, is all about. The president knew exactly what was going to be said at that press briefing uh, on Thursday. He's the one who directed it be held. Uh, it came as a result of a National Security Council meeting we had held the Friday before, where the heads of the operating agencies and departments and uh, the four who attended the press briefing on Thursday and others told the president what was doing. He felt it was important that the American people hear directly from the people responsible for uh, election security at the federal level. Uh, uh, hear what they were up to, at least in, in a non-classified environment. Me, so let, so let that's me, why we had the briefing. This, though, because they're saying this is a clear and present danger, that Russia did it in 2016. They're continuing to do it now. You have the Secretary of Homeland Security with her hair on fire saying our democracy is in the crosshairs. And then you have President Trump saying we're being hindered by the Russia hoax. That, that's not the, the press making that up. That's anybody who looks at it has got to see a difference there. I think what he's saying by the hoax is the idea that somehow the Russians directed and controlled his campaign or direct and control uh, his administration, that there was some conspiracy or some violation of but U.S. law in 2016. Russian meddling. He's, he's uh, handed down an indictment of 12 military intelligence officers of the GRU. And there's no question that that's going on. That's what everybody that's said on hoax. Thursday. The, the hoax is the idea that the Trump campaign was, uh, was the beneficiary uh, of a concerted effort together with the Russians uh, to affect the 2016 election. As to that, I don't think there's any evidence publicly. But everybody who participated in the press conference Thursday agreed, as has the president on several public occasions, that the intelligence community assessment of Russian meddling in 2016 is valid. But one of the most powerful ways that Mr. Trump can try to, to prevent any meddling in the 2018 election is to stand up in public and call out Vladimir Putin and say, knock it off. I want to go back to Helsinki and to the joint summit news conference there. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. 
I know you say that it was the first issue, election meddling, that President Trump brought up with Putin in their one-on-one -on -one meeting. But why not stand there right alongside Putin with the whole world watching and say, we are not going to stand for any more meddling? Well, as the president said, uh, he misspoke uh, at a subsequent point in the press conference and that he intended to say that just that. He had uh, a statement issued the next day uh, that I think made clear where he stood on the issue. And as I say, you can't read any uh, motive into what he did other than his deep concern about Russian election meddling than to put the four operating heads and myself out for that press briefing. The whole point of that was to show what his administration was doing to counter Russian meddling and other broader influence even, operations right now. But even in Kristen Fisher's piece about the rally last night, he talks about meddling and he said there were a lot of people involved. There was Russia, there was China, there was North Korea. No, there wasn't. It was Russia that was interfering. That's who everybody's been focusing on. That's who you focused on in your briefing. Right. There's no question that Russia was the principal violator in 2016 and that their activity this year puts them in the lead. Although, as people said, activity so far at least is down from 2016. But it does not exclude uh, the potential for others to meddle. And the broader issue that I think FBI Director Christopher Wray talked about in particular of influence efforts that go beyond the specifics of a particular election. And I think that's very troubling, too, and something we need more focus on. I, you talked about the media and the idea that they all jump off the, the, the telephone line at this not, electric... Not every one of them, but a, lot <laughs> of them. But, but a lot of them do at the same time. In a much more direct way, the president critiqued the media. And I want to put up his tweet. He's been on something of a Twitter tear today, and this is one of them. The fake news hates me saying that they are the enemy of the people only because they know it's true. I am providing a great service by explaining this to the American people. They purposely cause great division and distrust. They can also cause war. They are very dangerous and sick. Ambassador, what wars have we started? Look, I think the, uh, the issue of press bias has been around for a long, long time. As a boy, I supported Barry Goldwater in 1964. I thought the press was biased against him. I don't think it's changed uh, much since then. I absolutely agreed. There is press bias. People, you know, people get stories wrong, and, and people are called out for it. And we should be called out if we make a mistake. Cause war, sick, divisive, this is taking it to a completely different level. Well, that's, that's the president's view based on the, uh, the uh, attacks that the media have made on him. There have been other uh, administrations that have uh, been highly critical of the press as well. You can go back. I remember John Kennedy cutting off the White House subscription to the New York Times. It was uh, the Herald Tribune, but close enough. Sorry, close enough. I was, I was much younger then. What can I say? <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think this, is, uh, this kind of adversary relationship is typical. Okay. Uh, North Korea. This week we learned that North Korea continues to produce plutonium, continues to build new missiles. There are reports that North Korea is violating the sanctions by ship to ship transfers. They've done it, but it's increasing that China and Russia are stepping up their efforts to ease around the sanctions. At what point does the Trump administration say that Kim is playing us, that he isn't serious about denuclearization, and, and basically call him on this. Yeah. Well, that point may well come. As I've said to you and others before, there's nobody in this administration starry-eyed about the prospects of uh, North Korea actually denuclearizing. But I think what's going on now is that the president is giving Kim Jong-un a master class in how to hold a door open for somebody. And if the North Koreans can't figure out how to walk through it, uh, even the president's fiercest critics will not be able to say it's because he didn't open it wide enough. Uh, we're going to have to see performance from the North Koreans. There's no question about it. How, how soon, though? I mean, there's talk that in these exchange of letters, they're discussing another summit. Well, they're talking about, uh, in the exchange of letters, uh, what is necessary to get performance on the commitment that North Korea itself made in Singapore to denuclearize. That's the central issue for us. Uh, there's a lot of interest in inter-Korean uh, negotiations. They're looking at further discussions there, too. That's important to them. That's not our priority, though. Our priority is North Korean denuclearization. Kim Jong-un promised South Korean President Moon Jae-in at Pan Moonjam on April the 27th that he would do it and that he would do it within a year. So the, the, the focus here is getting Kim Jong-un 
to follow through on what he committed to the president at Singapore. So you're willing to leave the door open for a year and then it shuts? No, the year, the year period, there's been a lot of discussion about where, where the idea of finishing this in a year comes from. It comes from Kim Jong-un, that if they make a strategic decision to give up nuclear weapons, they can do it within a year. We're waiting to see evidence that, in fact, that strategic decision has been made. And, and have you seen evidence of that strategic the, the, the Unfortunately, I can't talk about intelligence, uh, whether it's leaked into the news media or not. I'll just say the president's doing everything he can, beginning with the film that he showed to Kim Jong-un in Singapore about what the future could be if North Korea denuclearizes. He's doing the best salesman's job he can on that point. We seem a long way away from building condos on beaches in North Korea. I have one last question. I got a minute. I don't want a condo on a beach in North Korea under any circumstances. <laughs> All right. That makes two of us. Uh, I got one minute left. Remember your, your, your training here in TV. We're, we seem to be starting an escalating trade war with China. Uh, I want to put these up on the screen. We've imposed or scheduled tariffs on $50 billion of Chinese goods. They've retaliated. Now we're talking about 25% tariffs on $200 billion more in Chinese exports, and they're threatening tariffs on another $60 billion of U.S. products. Here's White House economic advisor Larry Kutlow. The president is impatient. You know, so he has said to our team, um, take a look, take a look at raising the tariff on the last 200 from 10 to 25. Take a look, not implement. He's impatient. How far is President Trump prepared to go here in his standoff with China? And if Chinese President Xi doesn't blink, doesn't back down, how long is this could this go on? Well, I think as Larry was saying, don't underestimate President Trump's resolve here. And the reason he's so resolved is that for decades, China's been the principal malefactor trying to use a free trade uh, aspiration most of the rest of the world has to pursue mercantilist goals. It, it steals American and European intellectual property. It engages in force my question, technology transfer. How far are you prepared to take this? Uh, far enough to get China to change its behavior. And they need to understand that. And if they don't change their behavior? I think the pressure will continue. I think the president's made that very clear. Ambassador Bolton, thank you. Thanks for your time. Always good to talk with you, sir. Glad to be with you. When we come back, Senator Marco Rubio joins us exclusively to talk about his push to hit Russia if they meddle in our midterms, as well as his plan for paid family leave. And a little later, should blueprints to make a plastic gun in your own home be available online? The debate over these homemade firearms and free speech. That's all coming up. President Trump's off-the-cuff statements about Russia, North Korea, and Iran stand in contrast to the rest of his administration and much of the Republican Party. We want to discuss that with Senator Marco Rubio, a key member of the Senate Foreign Relations and Intelligence Committee. Senator, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. You are trying to get the Senate to pass what you call the Deter Act, which would invoke automatic sanctions against Russia or any country that interferes with U.S. elections. Here's what some top intel officials of the Trump administration said this week. Russia attempted to interfere with the last election and continues to engage in malign influence operations to this day. It's pervasive, it is ongoing uh, with the intent uh, to achieve their intent, and that is drive a wedge and undermine our democratic values. Senator, if you can get Congress to pass your legislation, given what we just heard there, should sanctions be imposed on Russia right now? Well, there's always cause for sanctions against Vladimir Putin's government because of their consistent and ongoing violations of human rights and the like. And there have already been sanctions in place. And to their credit, this administration has imposed tough sanctions already for what happened in 2016. But what we're hoping to do is deter future activity. In essence, create a situation where Vladimir Putin has to weigh the costs and the benefits. We're going to show him what the costs are by detailing them ahead. And then when he weighs the costs and the benefits of taking similar action in 2018, hopefully he'll determine the costs are too high compared to the benefit. I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee that if we don't do something, he will interfere again in multiple ways, because right now the costs are too unpredictable and too low. Well, one interesting aspect of your legislation is that it would 
under the, the bill. It's the director of national intelligence, not the president, who would certify that interference had taken place. Given all the president's talk about the Russia hoax, don't you trust him to call out Kremlin meddling? I do, if, especially if it happens in 2018. I think, and that's part of the bill that we'll probably have to rework in some way. There's some concern about it because we want to pass a bill. And so our, the important thing we want to do is, make, is create an automatic way for sanctions to kick in. Now, there probably is going to have to be an addition of a presidential waiver like all sanctions bills have and the like. The DNI will still play a key role. Uh, that's the way we crafted it. But I know my, the partner I'm working with on this, Senator Van Hollen, a Democrat, and I are willing to make reasonable changes to the bill that allows us to pass it. And that's probably one of those that we've heard a little bit of pushback on. We want to get something done. We're willing to do whatever it takes to pass a law that has real sanctions that will deter, but at the same time can pass the House, pass the Senate, and will be signed into law by the White House. President Trump this week tweeted this about the Russia investigation. I want to put it up on the screen. Attorney General Jeff Sessions should stop this rigged witch hunt right now before it continues to stain our country any further. Afterwards, you said that special counsel Robert Mueller should be allowed to finish his work and all the truth should come out. In, in pursuit of that truth, should President Trump sit down with a special counsel to answer any questions about Russian collusion, about obstruction of justice? And what if he refuses and the special counsel gets a subpoena? Well, the second question is really for the president's lawyers. I'm not in a position to give legal advice to the president about what the right thing to do or not do in those circumstances. But let me talk about the first part of it, and that is the president, look, this is no mystery, okay? He believes strongly. He says he knows for a fact, obviously, that he did not collude with the Russians, and he thinks this investigation that Mueller's conducting is solely about collusion, and that's how he feels very strongly about that. My position, based on everything I know about this case, is the following. I believe it is in the best interest of the president and of the United States of America and the American people for that investigation to run the course, for all the truth to come out, and for, I think that's the best thing that could happen for him, and I think that's the best thing that could happen for the country. Obviously, he is annoyed by that investigation continuing to go on because it's about him, and, and he believes and has said repeatedly and emphatically that he did not collude with the Russians. I'm limited in what I can say because the Senate is still doing our investigation, but I, I'm comfortable in saying this. If there was evidence, strong evidence of collusion, I guarantee you it would have been leaked by now. But let's wait for the process to play itself out. And, uh, and I, I think that's what should happen. But, Mueller should continue. He should finish his work. And the truth should come out. And I think that's in the best interest of everyone, but, including but as, the president. But as part of that process, and you say the best interest of the president and the country, should he sit down and answer all questions? Well, it's easy to say that from a political realm, but that's not an interview. It's an interview with a law enforcement official, with a special prosecutor. And there, there are plenty of people who are innocent whose lawyers would tell them, do not sit down and answer questions from a prosecutor, uh, because there's all sorts of other uh, problems involved with that. That's a decision for the president to make alongside with his attorneys. It's my understanding from what I've read in the press that he wants to do it. It's his attorneys who have uh, questions about that. But there are plenty of innocent people whose lawyers tell them, do not sit down with a prosecutor and answer questions. So I don't want to prejudge this or, or somehow imply that by not sitting down, he's guilty of something. Let's turn to North Korea. Do you think that the Kim regime is playing President Trump? Do you think they have any intention of giving up their nuclear and missile arsenal? What I'm about to tell you, I hope I'm wrong about, but I do not believe that he is ever going to give up his nuclear arsenal. What I do believe he will do is a series of unilateral concessions that do not undermine his capabilities in the long term. For example, I think he's more than willing to tear apart facilities that are no longer necessary for old missiles because he's got newer ones that work better. I believe he has undisclosed sites that he thinks he can shield from the world. I believe that, uh, that he, can, he believes that even if he gets rid of some of the thing, uh, new enrichment capability, he already has existing weapons and existing enriched capabilities that he can hide from the, rest, from the world. And every single time that he does one of these productions, he is engendering goodwill internationally, which is ultimately his goal, to undermine international support 
support for sanctions by arguing, look at all these things I'm doing. The Americans are not reciprocating and undermining sanctions at the UN uh, and, and internationally. Well, That's well, his goal, Senator, in my me, opinion, and I hope I'm wrong. Well, Senator, let me ask you about that, because it appears to be working. We understand that North Korea is violating uh, the sanctions by doing ship-to-ship -ship transfers. We now hear that Russia uh, is doing business with North Korea, that they are bringing thousands of more guest workers into the country who are in effect, in effect slaves who send money back to the regime. I mean, isn't Kim succeeding in lowering the temp temperature, breaking apart the alliance of sanctions, and President Trump is being played? Well, neither one of those two things are new. The labor to Russia has been going on for the whole time. The ship-to-ship -ship transfer is the only way they've been able to evade. I think what we need to be very careful about is undermining, for example, any split between us and South Korea. They're going to try to exploit it. I think the Chinese are trying to drag this out. The Chinese would love for this to be a step-by-step -step process that drags out. I think their biggest concern initially was that we would cut a deal with them directly. I don't know if the president's being played. I think he's hoping for the best but prepared for the worst. The sanctions remain in place. We haven't changed the single sanction on North Korea. I think what they need to be more cautious about is we need to continue to engage our partners around the world so that they're fully aware of what's actually happening in North Korea and what isn't happening, what's real and what isn't real. That's what I'd be very cautious about. I don't have any concerns about anything they've done so far. I want to ask you about one of your other big issues, and that is you have introduced legislation to create paid family leave. You would take the money that would go to the parents of newborn children from Social Security payments they would get later on. Democrats say, one, the benefit is too small, two, it shouldn't come out of retirement payments, and third, they say that most people take family leave for illnesses, either their own or family members, they don't take it uh, for childbirth, and in fact, Ivanka Trump, who's a big supporter of paid family leave, said there's no chance this is going to happen in this Congress. Well, we've got three months. Nothing is going to happen in this Congress other than the bills that are already stacked up and ready to go. This Congress ends in six months, five months, and we have elections in between. This is a big issue. It's a revolutionary idea, and it's going to take time to pass. Now, here's what it does. It's very simple to understand. Number one, it's an option. You don't have to do this. Number two, the benefit is comparable to what you're going to get in the private sector in terms of paid family leave for the birth of a child. And number three, the concept is this. If you choose to take paid family leave at least six weeks up to 12 weeks, you can take, you can decide that some of your retirement benefits from your money in Social Security, you can advance it and take it now and uh, instead of later, a portion of it. It's up to you. It's a choice you have. It's right. an option you have for the 85% of Americans that today have no options at all other than to skip paychecks. How many people can afford to skip one paycheck, not to mention four or five or six after the birth of a child? Senator Rubio, thank you. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Please come back, sir. We will. Thank you so much. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss President Trump's escalating attacks on the media. The face-off with reporters gets even more heated. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about the president's threat to shut down the government before the midterm elections over funding for his border wall? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. I'm a little torn myself. I would personally prefer before, but it, whether it's before or after, we're either getting it or we're closing down government. We need border security. It'd be bad politics for the Republican Party if we shut the government down. We'd get blamed. Senator Lindsey Graham warning President Trump not to shut down the government over immigration issues ahead of the November midterms. And it's time now for our Sunday group. GOP strategist Karl Rove, Philippe Reines, former senior advisor to Hillary Clinton, Susan Page of USA Today, and Jason Riley from the Wall Street Journal. Well, Carl, simple question. Would shutting down the government over the wall and immigration issues help or hurt Republicans in the midterms? Hurt the Republicans. They're seen as being in charge of the government, and they got the presidency, the Senate, and the House. And if they can't get their act together, regardless of how strong the president uh, describes the, the, the uh, culprits as being the Democrats, it will hurt the Republicans. Remember one thing. The president's approval is 46-51 in the latest Fox poll. His approval in that poll on immigration is... 4355. He's worse on immigration among the Americans than his overall approval rating. So don't push immigration? 
Well, don't shut down the government over immigration. Shut down If you want to shut down the government, shut down the government over the economy, where it's actually seen as doing the right thing. But people don't believe, particularly when it comes to the wall, that, it, that it's the right thing. The wall, the wall is the, the weakest. Border security is great. You'll notice he has stopped talking about the wall, and he's talking about border security, because even inside the White House, they figured out the wall is not as popular as border security. We ask you for questions for the panel, and on this issue of a possible shutdown, we got this on Twitter from independent O2. If POTUS, the president, shuts down the government, how is he going to get his SCOTUS, Supreme Court pick, confirmed? And should the Republicans be blamed if POTUS does this? Philippe, how do you answer independent O2? Well, uh, as my insider knowledge of the GOP, I mean, I think this is another example of uh, the president posing a bigger problem to his own party than the Democrats, who would uh, most of the time are just innocent bystanders to this. I don't know what he gets out of it, but I don't think he cares what he gets out of it. You have, uh, I don't think he really cares what happens uh, in November of 2018. Well, come on, wait, wait, wait. Of course he does. He I don't think he does, He frankly. knows what happens to his agenda if he loses the House. I think he knows that he gets to run against the House in 2020. I think he does not fear impeachment. Um, it won't be a problem. I don't think he buys into it as much as maybe Carl does or the, uh, his Republican colleagues in Congress do. All right. I want to switch subjects. I know you want to weigh in on this, but I'm going to switch subjects and turn to the president's bashing in the media. I know it's always all about us, but it seemed to hit critical mass this week. I, I, you just heard my conversation uh, with Ambassador Bolton in which the president says the fake media can cause wars. They're sick, divisive. We also had this fascinating contradiction this week between Ivanka Trump, who spoke about the fake media, and then President Trump just hours later. Take a look. I have some sensitivity around um, why people uh, have concerns and, and gripe, especially when they're sort of feel targeted. Um, but no, I do not feel that the media is the enemy of the people. They can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. And Susan, there was also that moment in the White House briefing room this week where CNN reporter Jim Acosta, some will say that he was grandstanding. I kind of agree with that. But he challenged uh, Sarah Sanders, the press spokeswoman, to declare that the press, the media are not the enemy of the people, and she refused. You know, I care more about what the president says than I care about what the press secretary says. And for the, you know, Mr. Bolton, in your interview, said that an adversarial relationship with the White House is, is common with the press. And having covered six White Houses, that is true. No White House really likes the press. But the rhetoric that the president is using, enemy of the people, this is a phrase from Stalin, uh, is chilling and unprecedented in modern times. Uh, it does not recognize the role that the founders saw for a free and vigorous press to be to hold officials accountable and to be the friend of the American people. I think it's I think it's enormously serious. And Jason, I, I, let me just ask you a question. <laughs> you had U.N. officials who were in charge of freedom of expression around the world this week say that these kinds of comments. And again, I don't think we're talking about criticism of the media. We're talking about fake news, starting wars, enemy of the people, that it undermines the role of a free press around the world to hold governments accountable. Ivanka Trump is right. Uh, the, the press is not the enemy of the people, and 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 you're right that uh, this, some of the, what, what this rhetoric coming out of the White House is unprecedented. But so is some of the behavior of the media these days. Uh, media that is supposed to be covering this White House objectively and is behaving much more like political activists than they are like objective journalists. This, too, I think, has is, is reached a, a new low in terms of the press behavior. Uh, and, and, and when that happens, I do believe that the press deserves to be called out here. The, the, the press should not be the story. The story should be what, making sure that the voters are informed. And, and, and too the often these wait, days, wait, the, the press is make, making themselves the, president the story. Doesn't, well, wait a minute. The president makes them the story. And that's due to this adversarial relationship that I think all administrations have. The problem here is that the press too often takes the bait. 
right. and, and, and we well, get into these that. cycles, <laughs> and this is what we end up talking about. And, and the press loves the press loves talking about the press. That is that is incorrect. <laughs> I, as a reporter, I do not love talking about the press. I wish the press could be in a more traditional role here. I think what is happening. There's certainly things to criticize about the press. There's no question about that. We ought to be held accountable for our errors. But I think what the president is doing is undermining faith in the institutions that stand to challenge him, and that would include the press and the. the let me wait. Let me let me bring in Carl because as a White House official, you were, I'm sure you felt, the victim of unfair coverage. Where's the line between legitimately criticizing the media for things that, as Jason points out, we do wrong, whether it's bias reporting and accurate reporting, and what the president is doing right now? Look, uh, any White House has the right, if it disagrees with coverage, to be specific and precise in criticizing that coverage. If the, wall, if the well, New York Times has a bad story about the Trump administration, I, don't, uh, I think the administration ought to say, we think this is what's wrong. But look, the veracity of these generalized slurs, if you will, against the press and the frequency of them is disturbing to me. I watched the speech. And there was, I, I lost track about 18 or 19 times that the president went after the press. And every time he did, that crowd roared its approval. But that crowd represents the hardcore Trump base. This does not help him with his bigger problem. Back to the, to the Fox poll, 46, 51 approve, 28 percent strongly approve. Those were the people who were screaming their cheers when he said enemy of the people. But 41 percent strongly disapprove. That's why the president's numbers are so he is enraging the opposition while simply reinforcing a much smaller base. Uh, you were talking before about how maybe uh, losing the midterms would be good, would be smart politics, or at least not caring. Is bashing the press smart politics for this president? Absolutely. It's working for him, but that doesn't mean it's right. And I think it's part of a larger problem that's part of a war on the truth. And to be honest with you, you know, I've been on, on the other side of this. I think you know that, and Susan probably knows that. Again, media, we should point out, you work for Hillary Clinton. I did, and, you know, the media is not always perfect. But you know what? You get on the phone, you talk about it. You don't call them the any of the people. My, my beef now is the media has to just accept that this is not normal behavior, and they have to realize that they are in combat, and they have to start acting differently. They have to stop broadcasting the daily press briefings live, get rid of the soap opera aspect of it, the grandstanding. They have to use the word lie when he lies, etc. Well, I disagree with that. Thank you, panel. <laughs> See you next Sunday. When we come back, the debate over 3D printed guns. Cody Wilson wants Americans to have the information to make guns in the privacy of their own homes. He joins us next. He's been called one of the most dangerous people in the world for his push to put blueprints online to make guns on 3D printers. And now Cody Wilson is at the center of a legal battle over making that information available to everyone on the Internet. Mr. Wilson, director of Defense Distributed, joins us now from Austin, Texas. So, simple question. Why on earth do you think putting these blueprints for plastic guns online is a good idea? Hey, Chris. So I've put the blueprints for all types of guns, all technical plans, all data, all blueprints, past and present. I've put them all online, and that's the right that I've secured. It's not like I'm somehow only fascinated by the idea of a printable gun. That was just a mere technical demonstration of a much wider possibility of the digital production of firearms, which is in no way precluded by current law. But as I understand it, you say this is your First Amendment right. You're talking about information that you're putting online, not what happens after people receive that information. But I don't have to tell you that the First Amendment is not an absolute right. You're not allowed to cry fire in a crowded theater. Uh, courts have, have exercised prior restraint to stop people from publishing troop movements in the time of war. It's not an absolute right, Cody. So, Chris... As the hardest newsman in the game, I'd expect you to not propagate that ignorance, right? Fire in a crowded theater has not been good law for over 40 years. That case was replaced. The standard is even the most inflammatory speech is protected by the First Amendment unless it produces imminently unlawful action, right, or direct incitement or is likely to produce uh, imminent harm. And, I mean, th these are not the standards. Like, we need to correct the people's ignorance here. Fire in a crowded theater is a pseudo-profundity, okay? The First Amendment, without question, protects this kind of data lawfully produce, uh, it's got a cognizant government authority, 
it's directly related to another protected right of the people, which is their Second Amendment. So speech about another amendment is even more protected. Well, wait, 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 wait. Like, First of all, we don't know whether it's protected because, in fact, a judge issued a temporary restraining order. There's going to be a court hearing about this this week. And I know you're going to you're going to be pursuing this here. You, you talk about speech that that incites or creates the opportunity for illegal action. Here's the problem with putting these blueprints about plastic guns on the internet it allows people to create uh, to make guns that are untraceable there's no serial number it allows them to make guns that are undetectable they're all plastic they could get through a metal detector it also allows people who would be prohibited from having guns uh, whether it's uh, someone with a history of mental illness a felon a domestic abuser even a terrorist it allows them to make guns take a look at, at, at democratic senator ed markey here he is these downloadable firearms are available even to those who could not pass a background check. It's the ultimate gun loophole. The NRA has supported the law that makes these guns, undetectable firearms, illegal for 30 years. So, uh, Chris, I don't think Ed Markey knew you could legally make a gun in this country until last week. And I think that's part of like what's inflammatory to at least the Democratic establishment. This is also their discovery that it's been legal in this country since its founding to make a gun for yourself. Well, I'm sorry that you just found that out. OK, but you should have you should have made a law, right? Your Congress make a law, make it illegal to make guns in this country. I'd but, like to see but, that. But they did make an undetectable firearms act, which passed 30 years ago, Cody. Right. And, and look, it's legal to make a gun if you include a, a, a requisite amount of metal in it. And Chris, like, this is why I'm not in jail today, right? My printable guns had the amount of metal in it. I, you know, there's security norms. I respect the norms. Of course, maybe even that type of law ultimately couldn't survive Second Amendment scrutiny. But I'm not here to argue for, for or against our security norms. I'm literally here to argue that what I won in court over five years in the Western District of Texas was the right, and not just singularly, but all Americans have the right to share data for making firearms on the internet. This is not controversial. The progressive case, the H-bomb, nuclear, nuclear plans, these are all protected by the First Amendment. I'm sorry that some people are just waking up to the idea that the First Amendment protects scientific inquiry that doesn't advantage, what, the gun control movement? You first put a blueprint online in 2013, uh, and it was downloaded almost 100,000 times before you were stopped by the government. Uh, since you put the uh, blueprint again after a settlement with the federal government online, it was downloaded more than 20,000 times. To its, is, this, is the genie already out of the bottle? Is, is this information already out there and we're arguing uh, about something that's already happened? Uh, frankly, Chris, that's that's the case. When these attorneys general came into Washington, they said, Your Honor, he's going to release all this stuff August 1. Well, look, in one sense, I released it five years ago. In another sense, I released it July 27th. I can't make a judge read a brief, okay? But these are APA claims. These aren't Gun Control Act claims. These, these attorneys general have no standing. The judge can't even review the decision that the State Department made. So I'm just sitting here watching all these gun files already online and people arguing about what reality is when we both know that guns are now downloadable and they have been repeatedly demonstrated to be. To a certain degree, I think uh, you're protecting yourself. Hey, I'm just making the information available. I'm not responsible for what people do once they get the information. But the fact is, Cody, there are real world consequences here. What if somebody takes your information, makes a gun, and then goes out and kills someone, potentially God forbid, kills a member of your family. Would there be, do you bear any responsibility? Do you, would you feel any remorse? So I credit the question as like an honest question. I, I credit your question as good faith, right? But I literally believe in the Second Amendment to the point of that it's all right and it should be expected that there will be social costs for protecting a right like this. Why is the people's right to keep and bear arms on the Bill of Rights? Why is it even protected? Because we know that there are downsides and that there are consequences to allowing free people to, to own the means of self-defense. I mean, of course, we should expect and have a mature attitude that bad things can happen. But, but the government has made decisions that for the, the right, best of society, certain people should be prevented from having guns and that there should be, it, it should be easier to trace and easier to detect. You're going around to all of that, Cody. Oh, I disagree. With respect, I disagree. The, the government has regulated commercial manufacturers of arms. 
and arms and transfer and interstate commerce, but the government has never regulated the production of firearms that you're allowed to own. An American t can, to this day, right now, make a gun, and there's no requirement to put a serial number on it. Again, I'm sorry that a bunch of politicians woke up to the reality of this just last week, but this is the way it's always been. Cody, Cody Wilson, thank you. Thanks for talking with us. A pleasure. Up next, our Power Player of the Week. The Army's art collection puts powerful Nazi propaganda from World War II under lock and key. One of the highlights of this job is to get to see historical treasure troves that aren't open to the public. As we told you in February, the Army opened its doors to show us one of its explosive collections. Here's our Power Player of the Week. They used it to uh, enhance, in their view, sort of the sanctity uh, of the Nazi way of life. Charles Bowery is the chief of Army history, and we met at a huge warehouse at Fort Belvoir outside Washington that holds thousands of pieces of military art and artifacts. The battle standard of an African-American regiment in the Civil War, a Taliban motorcycle, Norman Rockwell illustrations from World War II. Do you ever feel like you're in that huge warehouse at the end of Indiana Jones? We make that joke all the time. But we were there to see the Army's stash of Nazi propaganda. 586 pieces seized during Hitler's fall and sent back to the U.S. Hitler's retreat at Berchtesgaden, the luxurious mountain residence. The man in charge of the operation, Gordon Gilkey, who was appointed by President Roosevelt. Why was it so important to remove this art from Germany post-war? They believed that the presence of these pieces in German society could be essentially a powder keg that could kick off additional incidents of the rise of Nazism. Pieces like this 1937 painting, in the beginning was the word. The piece is very intentionally titled to mirror the first verse of the book of John in the Bible, uh, and it very clearly equates Adolf Hitler with John the Baptist. It's an almost godlike figure and his disciples. That's correct. The army seized another work called The Standard Bearer. It portrays Adolf Hitler as a medieval knight. He's carrying a Nazi flag, he's mounted on a horse, and he is prepared to lead his people into battle. Now what is this hole there? An American soldier took his rifle bayonet and he punched through the eye of Hitler as a direct message. The army found this huge bust of Hitler in the Eagle's Nest. Where the Nazi Fuhrer held meetings of triumph in the mountains of Bavaria. A grand hall he used for key meetings. The monumental scale of it conveys his personal power and the fact that this was a cult of personality that he led through individual magnetism. Perhaps most fascinating are these watercolors painted by Hitler as an aspiring art student and then a soldier in World War I, long before his rise to power. One of the comments on his early evaluations of his work was that while he was pretty good at depicting buildings and structures, he was not so good at depicting human life. But chances are you will never get to see any of these works in person. The Army keeps them locked up in its mammoth storage facility. Is there concern that some of these pieces could be used as a rallying point for neo-Nazis here in this country? That's the heart of the, the tight control that we maintain over the collection. It could be potentially dangerous. The term I like to use uh, is, uh, is powerful. The Army is building a national museum near Fort Belvoir to open in 2020 that will house many of the military artifacts now in that huge warehouse. But don't expect to see any of the Nazi propaganda that glorifies a tyrant. And that's it for today. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Fox News Sunday.